Um, yeah, so announcements. We have a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and that we are maintaining in a virtual manner. Uh, to be honest with you, it's just a lot easier. One of the silver linings that came out of COVID was, uh, you know, we all got quite a bit more uh, comfortable with Zoom or other platforms. We use Zoom. So you can access the prayer meeting, 630, access it through our website. Uh, I'll open the link, and uh, we don't normally do video. We just log in, and we pray for an hour. You just commit a time of our uh, of intercession. Also, uh, we have a marriage tune-up, what we're calling a tune-up, because uh, every marriage needs to get the oil changed every now and then. Uh, just get some fresh infusion of purpose and meaning and grace and all the things that are necessary to keep a mar marriage healthy and alive. So that'll be from 8.30 to 11.30. And then lastly, our Think Together series that we do periodically throughout the year. We'll have another one coming up September 11th. The topic is gender. Uh, we're approaching this one a little bit from the context of women's roles within the church, uh, roles within marriage, I'm sorry, I said women's roles. I mean men and women roles within the church and uh, obviously roles in society, in marriage, a uh, lot of layers. It's impossible to cover all things in one of these things together. We basically just kind of scratch this, your interest and then give you a bunch of resources and make ourselves available. I just want to remind you the fact that we are doing this is because we want to talk about things that are important in our lives. Uh, and that goes beyond what happens here at the pulpit on a Sunday morning. This, sun, this purpose here is to preach the Word of God and to be edified. And again, kind of sometimes raises more questions than answers. So uh, we try to provide a, a platform where we can talk about things just very honestly. All right? Having said that, we don't record those. So it will not be streamed. That keeps it, uh, you know, what happens here... Well, whatever happens in church, you don't want to stay here, <laughs> right? You want it to go with you where you go. So uh, those are our announcements. Uh, this morning, turn to Colossians chapter 3, and we'll pick up right where we left off last week, which was in chapter 3, verse 4. Last week, we looked at the first four verses of Colossians chapter 3, we'll pick it up here at verse 5, and I don't think we're going to get very far. Let me just say this right up front, a little um, disclaimer. We're going to talk about some adult content today. Uh, Paul brings up a list of five vices uh, that are mostly sexual in nature, so... Just making you aware of that, um, not that that's going to change anybody's, you know, what you're doing here this morning, but I'm just, I guess I felt like I wanted to say that. So let's pick it up at verse 5. Therefore, therefore, now I'm reading New King James, uh, the word therefore, as far as I could see, shows up in most other, almost all other translations. Uh, it might not be the first word, but it's there, <laughs> all right? And whenever you see therefore, what do you say to yourself? What is it there for? <laughs> it is there to make application, okay? So we'll talk about that for a little bit this morning. So that's exactly what Paul is doing. By the way, the, the rest of the book of Colossians is from here now to the end is, is applicational, at least from chapter 3, verse 5, through chapter 4, verse 6. Okay, just if you're interested, uh, that's what he does in the next portion of this letter to this church. He starts to take all the theological beauty that he has shown us about the glory of Jesus Christ, which is the theme of his letter, right? We remind ourselves of that every week. The theme in the, in the, of Paul's writing this letter is the glory of Jesus Christ, which means his character, his sufficiency, his supremacy, and, his, and it's all those things and many, many more. I'm just trying to make it simple so that we keep 
uh, a handle on what Paul is saying here. He talked about the glory of Jesus Christ. Now what he's doing with the therefore is he wants us to see the glory of Jesus Christ in everyday living, in the way that we live in fellowship with him as we walk through the various aspects of our life. He's going to get into the Christian home, husbands, wives, children. He's going to go into the workplace in the context of a slave-master relationship, which did exist back in Paul's day. We can talk about that in a workplace scenario. And he closes up with sort of a you know, our social life and our, and our prayer life. So that's a broad overview of where he goes in his practical section here in Colossians. Um, Paul gets into this, it's the famous put off, put on. <laughs> All right, just so you know, that's, um, he uses that word in verse 8, put off, verse 9, put off, and then verse 10, put on, and verse 12, put on. All right. Uh, and by the way, put on doesn't mean play the part. <laughs> you know, let's just put on like I'm a Christian. He's talking about actually living in reality with Jesus Christ. All right, Scott, get into it. So here we go. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, or slander, filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. It's important to remind ourselves what we studied last week, because Paul set a tone for us that helps us, understanding, helps us understand living out the Christian life. And what he said in verses 1 through 4 is he told us to seek those things which are above and to set our mind on those things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So seek and set your mind. Seek and keep on seeking Jesus in your everyday life and set your mind, it means establish in your mind that I want to discipline my mind so that I'm having constant open communication with Christ. With that in place, and let me just say again, Paul prior to that has with his, some of the most beautiful words in all of the Bible, especially in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, he elevates Christ and displays his glory in front of us in such a way that we come back almost blinded by the light, if you will, right? And then he keeps, he keeps his foot on the gas and he keeps 
saying that in, in various different ways, referring to his own testimony and, and to their testimony, and he, and he holds it up because they're being bombarded by self-improvement people who are coming at them with a religious thing to try to tell them how to change and how to really have an understanding of what's going on in the mysterious other world. And Paul's like, all right, that's happening, but keep your affections set on things above, not on things of the earth. And, and you'll, you'll be able to walk through the various ideologies that are being promoted today. All right. So what I'd like to do is I want to talk about that a little bit further. Uh, this idea of, of what it looks like. I want to take an event out of the life of Jesus that helps demonstrate what I've just said. In other words, Jesus is going to have an interaction with somebody who at the end of his interaction, this person is going to go away going, oh my goodness, he, he's the most remarkable man and God I've ever, I've never experienced anything like this. And then the Lord says to this woman, I'm giving it away a little bit, right? Go and sin no more, right? So in other words, the change that you've experienced in your relationship and in your interaction with me has, has set such a glory in your life. Now go out and it's not saying be sinless. That's Jesus knows better than that. And you know better than that from your own experience, even after being born again. Thank you, Andrew, for worship. I just love the song selection, how it worked beautifully with John chapter 8 and our text. Right? We've experienced a regeneration inside. I, I have a new life now, having been forgiven by Christ. And, and Paul's just like, don't ever move away from him. Right? He's all you need in every situation, and especially in dealing with the internal desires that we have, as he mentions here. So go back to John chapter 8. Let me just show you. Uh, again, I'm, I'm using this singular event in the life of Christ in John chapter 8, 1 through 11, where Jesus talks with a woman who was caught in adultery. So it, it really sets up the whole text in Colossians really well. As I'm saying, I'm, I'm using this as to show you what a dramatic change this had on this woman's life and then how it, it changed her for the rest of her life. Okay, so John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, is everybody there? John chapter 8, we good? Thank you. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the fairies, Pharisees, <laughs> fairies, <laughs> brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? They said, they said this, or this they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger and as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, brothers and sisters, let me just remind you of something here or two, a couple of things. That it's early in the morning, and Jesus is in the temple. He's actually sitting in a large, large open square area. It would be like going down to our commons down here in Ithaca, right? It's not a sheltered private meeting that he's having. He's sitting out in broad daylight, and he's surrounded by a good number of people, usually a multitude, right? 
And in the midst of this scene, here come these legalists with this woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, and they bring her to Jesus. And of course, it's Jerusalem. These are Jews. They have a law. Seventh commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery. All right? So in that context, they bring her to Jesus. Uh, You get the sense that it all happened pretty rapidly. She, of course, didn't know it was coming. And I'm guessing that they, maybe she just quickly used something to cover up. So she's standing there. I can't imagine, I can't imagine the humiliation and the shame that is happening publicly. Publicly. People all around Jesus, suddenly they're looking at this woman. And now everybody knows what she's done in secret. And there's this massive law that's hanging over her head. You shall not, and I have. But you see what Jesus has done? He's shown mercy. The first thing is he's shown mercy. He advocated for her. Between her accusers and her, he put himself right in the middle. And he advocated for her. And he's dismissed them eventually, pretty quickly. And then it's just him and her. And the way I understand the text is that when all is said and done, the only one that really could throw a stone is the one that hasn't sinned. They all sinned. I'll give them credit. They were honest enough to admit it. But he hasn't sinned. And that's why they brought her to him in the first place, because they can't find anything wrong with him. And so they've set him up. They thought they've set a trap, and he's, they're trying to in, let him self-incriminate by saying, you know, well, you want to be merciful? You can't, how can God be just and merciful at the same time? But you see, Jesus was merciful. He advocated for her, dismissed her accusers. Then he turns to her, and he says, The only one in this room right now that can accuse you, or that can accuse you and condemn you, is me. I don't do that. He showed her grace. That, my friends, is grace. I forgive you. I don't condemn you either. You got that? And so that woman has just been, in spite of Everything that's happened, she's standing there caught red-handed. In spite of it all, she's been forgiven. And she leaves there, I suggest to you, her eyes and her heart aflame with a desire to love and to follow this man who has forgiven me. I think it was F.F. Bruce... (laughs) who said that the New Testament is a religion of grace and ethics of gratitude. You see it? Do you see it in this woman? What happened, what transpired in her life? She went from, I could die, to now he's like, go live. And the way I want you to live from now on I want it to be manifested in what just happened to you personally. I want you to go out and to live, practice now, a life of sinning less. Right? Because of what I've done for you. That, I believe, is a a perfect setup to establish where Paul takes us in Colossians. So let's go back to Colossians, and we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Back to Colossians chapter 3. I I don't know. So, therefore, okay, so you might think of it, uh, students, as applied science. (laughs) Okay, I looked that up, by the way. I don't know, it was a weird thing that came into my mind during the week. Applied science is to take the conclusions discovered through the scientific method and to attain practical goals, okay? This, brothers and sisters, is applied theology. We've just taken 
the glory of Christ displayed in his character, in his compassion, in redeeming sinful men, bringing us into relationship with him. Now Paul is like saying to us, much like Christ said to that woman, now go and sin no more. And by the way, Let me just point out something to you that the Scriptures point out to us in this portion of Scripture in that it's all pointing toward one another. I tried to emphasize that as I read, and it particularly shows up in verses 12 through 17 as we put on the graces that are given to us of Christ's humility and loving kindness and such toward one another, forgiving one another, keeping the bond of the Spirit in love, right? So it's pointing to one another, to the church, to community. You know what that teaches me? It teaches me that what happens personally, the personal choices that I make as I'm walking out my life in fail fellowship with Christ, it has an effect on you and vice versa. The decisions in your obedience to walk in unity with Jesus, it has a powerful influence on me. That's why what happens here on a Sunday morning is supernatural. Because what's happened in your life through the week has been supernatural. Okay, so you might think, well, you know, uh, yeah, I'm just sitting in my chair and I'm going to go get in my car and I'm going to go home to my apartment or whatever it is, my house, and it was great to see some friends, but no, no, it's much, much deeper than that. Paul calls the church a body. Remember Corinthians chapter 12, where he refers to the church as he uses the analogy of a human body made up of many different parts. 1 Corinthians 12, he said, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one is honored, all rejoice together. So I'm just reminding you, my brothers and sisters, what the text reveals to us is that Paul, although he's going to get into the internal, the personal nature of things, it's pointing toward, and included in this, is our fellowship with one another. It's our fellowship with one another. Okay? Okay? Uh, what else? Well, let's look at it. Chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Um, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Uh, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Uh, My Bible says, upon the sons of disobedience. Um, By the way, that does not, Paul is not saying that here I am a Christian, if I do one of these things or have an evil desire, I'm going to lose my salvation. And God is going to take me away from his kingdom and now he's going to judge me. Isn't that what he's saying? He's saying that if you're not in the kingdom of God, if you haven't confessed your sin and ask Christ for forgiveness, then judgment awaits you because he's the creator of all things. He has that providential and sovereign right and he's worth serving. Verse 7, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. I want to bank on that just for a moment. (laughs) All right? in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. My brothers, my friends, attention please. We read together, the woman caught in adultery. Where did that happen? Anybody? Happened where? In public. At what city and what country? Jerusalem, in Israel. They were Jewish. They had a law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is Colossae. This is a Gentile city. It's a a Greek and a Romanized city. All right? They don't have a law. Not a moral law. Certainly not the ten, the big ten. Right? They don't have that. These are Gentiles. They're not Jews. 
They're aliens to the glory of Christ. Or they were. They were ignorant and deceived and disobedient and all these things that is true for all men. Paul would say in Ephesians, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. They were living in an idolatrous world that expressed their behavior. Hear me out. They were living in an idolatrous world that expressed their worship of their idols through all sorts of sexual activities. That's just what they did. You see it throughout the New Testament. Paul took the gospel. That man left Jerusalem and he left Syria, Antioch, that wonderful church in Antioch, Syria, and he headed off into these countries, into these cities, into that culture. And he took the gospel of a Jewish man, Jesus of Nazareth, dying on a cross for the sin of the world, and he took it out there and he says, now this is going to result in some change. It's going to be a marvelous thing to see what happens in the personal lives and in the corporate lives and in the cities in which they live. In fact, at one point in time, they said, Paul's turning this whole place upside down. He's turned the world upside down there in Ephesus. He was putting a herd on the, on the guys who were making the silver shrines to, F, to Diana. Because there was all kinds of expression of their, of their worship, of their pagan and, and many, many gods was expressed through their sexual activity. That's why, friends, when there was this big council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, very important meeting, very important meeting, I won't get into all the details, but the final result was, let's write a letter put it into Paul's hands, and he can take it to all these Gentiles living out in this world that are now Christians, just like us Jews here in Jerusalem. And let's tell them to abstain from sexual immorality. Why? Because they lived in a sex-soaked society. I don't think really there's anything different today than there was back then, except maybe access which is actually worse because as people who talk about pornographic issues, they always use AAA. It's accessible, it's affordable, and it's anonymous. Not so much in their culture. It was accessible, not so much anonymous because everybody knew. It might even have been worse than we have today. I mean, it was just open prostitution, male or female bestiality. There was all kinds of crazy stuff going on that was done in the name of their gods to appease them, to make sure that they get more sun and rain and they can have crops and live a good life. That was the culture in which Paul is writing. That's why he said to them, you yourselves once walked in the, and lived in them. Because he mentions five things in verse five. The big five. <laughs> the big five. Okay. Um, if you ever go to, you guys get that? It's actually supposed to be a joke, but if you ever go to Africa uh, and you go to the game farm, right? It's the big five. Anyway, Paul has a big five here. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So Paul's talking about people who used to live that way now go and sin no more. Now, I think it suggests that, yeah, I used to live like that, but you know what? I have memory, <laughs> and it's very powerful. I have muscle memory that's very powerful, <laughs> and sometimes I'm like walking past on my way home, and there she is, or he is, and it's like, I think maybe, and Paul's like, don't do that. <laughs> Put that off. Or old King James, Mortify, right? Put to death is what he says there in verse 5. All right? So this was the culture in which Paul was speaking into. And I just, verse 5, therefore put to death or mortify your members or your, or your desires which are on the earth. 
Now, I just want to mention a couple of things here. First of all, we get to cooperate with the power of the Holy Spirit. We get to cooperate with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you a couple things that I have just some observation. Paul never mentions the devil. He's not responsible for your actions. You are. Actually, Paul never mentions the Holy Spirit. He does in other places, Romans chapter 8, 13 particularly. But he doesn't even mention the Holy Spirit. Let me just say to you this. It might sound weird. The Holy Spirit is not responsible for fixing your problems. The Holy Spirit will reveal, He'll inspire, He'll encourage, He'll direct, He'll convict, He'll convince, He'll do a lot of powerful things to combat that which is happening inside your head and heart. It's up to you and me to respond to Him through real-time change of mind, change of actions. And I can just tell you right flat out, my brothers and sisters, it is glorious. It is glorious. Okay? We get to cooperate with the inspiration of the Spirit to keep this temple clean, if you will. So Paul says in verse 5, Therefore, because of everything that we've already seen, we, we're, we're going out now, we've just got, we've been looking squarely into the blinding glory of the light and the beauty of Jesus, and we've still got his son in my eyes. And he's like, now you go out and put to death your members which are on the earth. Now I want to work on this a little bit. I'm just going to work on verse 5 primarily for the rest of this sermon. I'll just tell you right now. And then we're going to make some application through the life of Joseph. Because I think that brother shows us in real time a really good, encouraging example. So I'm going to work on verse 5. Therefore, we're making application put to death. Now, there's various ways to translate put to death. Most translations say that. New American Standard does not, and I prefer theirs, to be honest. It literally, more appropriately, it means consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Consider the the desires that which is within you as dead, which of course poses a confusion. If I'm died with Christ and I'm buried with him and I'm raised with him, then am I dead or not? Because there's certainly things alive in me. And it's just a reality that we come to Two, when we become born again, to realize, yes, I, I am a new creation, as Paul would say in verse 10, right? According to the image of him who created him or her, right? But yeah, I find that I still have desires. So are they dead or not? Well, yeah, those desires have been crucified with Christ. Am I going to give them power? That's really how I see it. If you look it up, the word mortify, or we have put to death, it's three words. The actual word was nekrao. I'm not sure if I'm saying it exactly right. Uh, necropsy, anybody? You get, you're right? Something's dead, right? So deprive it of its power, or it'll kill you. Don't give it power, or it will kill you. I remember actually years ago preaching from this text. And right at that time, I don't know, it's probably been, gosh, seven, eight years ago. Right at that time, um, a farmer had a tragic farming accident. And a lot of times the farm accidents are gruesome, and this was one of those. Where the guy was chopping corn, all, everything's hydraulically operated, uh, and the source of the power comes from the tractor pulling the implement. And the man, the, the implement got plugged or something was wrong with it. He thought he had disengaged the power, but not all the way. He gets off his tractor, he goes to the implement to start to unplug the corn from the chopper, 
and the source flipped back into action and the thing started grinding up his arm. So what's he got to do? He reaches over and kicks and, and deprives the machine of its power before it kills him. A gross example, but you get my point. Paul's like, this thing is dead. It's not going to produce anything fruitful in my life. So let's not give it any power. Nekrao. The word is only used three times, and two other times it's referring to Abraham, who it says he considered not his own body, now dead. Hebrews 11, therefore sprang even from one, and him as good as dead. In other words, Abraham had gone beyond the age of being able to produce sperm, active sperm that would help Sarah become pregnant. God supernaturally gave both he and Sarah the ability to conceive. Praise the Lord. That's the point. Abraham did not consider the fact, okay, I can't really produce life out of this body anymore. That's the word Paul uses. Your evil desires are not going to produce life. Don't give them power. Deprive them of power. Consider them dead. How do you do that? That's the billion dollar question. How do you do that? It's not complicated. The same way you came to faith, where you looked at the cross and you said, I'm a sinner, Jesus, forgive me and help me. And he moves in by his spirit and he forgives you and he helps you. That's just what you do when temptation arises from within. And it's like, Lord Jesus, forgive me, help me. I'm, I'm struggling with this thing. As Paul would say, mortify your members which are on earth. This ain't heaven, friends. When we get to heaven, that's when the struggle is over. We will fight, we will struggle with their sinful desires as long as we're alive on this earth. Okay? Which stands in contrast to what Paul had just got done saying in chapter 3, verse 4. And he says, when Christ appears, you'll appear with him in glory. In other words, he's going to come in his shining brilliance, perfection, and you're going to be standing right there with him in shining, brilliant perfection. End of the sanctification process. Culminated when the Lord comes back. It's a struggle. But I'll tell you what, it's a glorious... You're going to win because <laughs> you're not fighting to get victory. You're fighting from victory. It's a famous line that's been, can't be overused, I don't think. Jesus has given us the victory, ultimately over the penalty of death, and now over the pleasure and the power of sin. So he's like, set your mind on things above. I went through it this week. I guess sometimes the Lord's like, okay, under shepherd, Pastor Scott, maybe you need to walk through this personally so you can share it with the compassion and the passion that you yourself have experienced. So I'm trying to set my things, my mind on things above, and yet my mind just keeps going way over here into all kinds of crazy stuff that's none of your business, but it's not good to talk about out loud. And I'm struggling, I'm struggling, and I got to be honest with you, at one point, I'm going down... <laughs> on this riding lawnmower, and all of a sudden I realize, wait a minute, I'm standing in glory right now. That's just like, it's gone. <laughs> it was real time. It was me. Lord, help. Lord, help. And then it's like off into another world. And Lord, help. And then I realized, and it was just such peace that prevailed in my life and such joy. It was real. Jesus Christ is alive. And, and I'm struggling with depriving the power and that lever wants to come on and I know it's going to chew me up. <laughs> so that's what it is. That's how you put it to death. You put your eyes into what is true, the Word of God. You look at Christ by faith. You study His Word. You memorize it. You stay in fellowship with one another. You confess your faults one to another. That's what I love about our PBM. I call it PBM, Pursuit of Biblical Manhood. Yesterday we had Pursuit of Biblical Manhood out at Andrew's place. We weren't sitting here eating 
delicious breakfast casserole and eating, drinking coffee, but we were fellowship out there. But I love it because it's, it's life on life. And, and nobody's pretending, nobody's putting on airs. We're like, dude, I struggle, would you pray? Yeah, I struggle too, man, let's go. Yeah, you know what, I found victory here. I'm just telling you, there's victory in Christ. And he's, and he's wanting to bless your life, just like he blessed that adulterous woman. You really, I, I think Jesus had a big smile on his face, don't you? As he looks at her, he's just like ear to ear. <laughs> I don't condemn you. Now go, enjoy life as you follow me. And now Paul gets into it. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. I'm just working verse 5. I'm, I don't want to exhaust you, but I do want to point out that the word your, put to death your members, it's plural. Now isn't that interesting? It's plural. It means anybody who's reading this or hearing this letter. Do you know what Paul doesn't do? He's not respectful of age. You, you're listening to this, old man, young person, and everything in between. He's not respectful of gender. He doesn't say, now I want all the men to listen to this. He just says, you're. Male or female. He's not respectful of status. I want all the single people to hear what I got to say right now. He goes, it's just you. The room is filled this morning. Well, not filled, but it has people in this room that are single and married. And it could also include those who are widowed or widower or divorced or cohabitating. He's not respectful of culture. You look at verse 11, and he goes through a whole list of names and, and cultures right there, Jew and Gentile. You know what that's emphasizing? Racial differences. These truths cross all racial boundaries. Circumcised or uncircumcised. He's crossing the boundaries of your religious background. Well, duh, Pastor Scott, you don't understand. I, I came out of, you know, whatever. This, okay. Paul's like, this applies to you. Whatever your gender, whatever your age, whatever your status, culture, barbarian, <laughs> Scythian. Barbarian means somebody who's not mentally or morally trained, uneducated. It's, it's, it's not respectful of any of those things. Or Scythian, right? That's a really strange mention there. He says in verse 11, which are people who are unruly, wild, just crazy behavior. It applies culturally, cross-culturally. Applies to everyone, everywhere, at all time. And then he says um, the big five. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, let me say this. Fornication, but by the way, if you notice, he moves from uh, external fornication are actual sex acts, he moves from that to the cause. He goes now below the surface into the heart. So this is what you're doing. This is why you're doing it. Well, that's what causes those things, right? Is he, did you notice that? Fornication. Then he gets into passion, evil desire, covetousness, right? In his list of five in verse eight, Paul actually reverses. He starts with the internal, anger, wrath, and then it's manifested in malice, slander, and filthy language. Okay, so interesting observation there. Uh, I'm going to work these words a little bit. They're beneficial if we work them over just a little bit. So how about I give you the Greek word for fornication? I'll give you the Greek word. You tell me what our translated English word is. Okay? 
So you can say it out loud. You tell me what you think the tran well, how that translates into in English. The Greek word for fornication is pornea. Oh, that's a no-brainer, <laughs> right? Pornea uh, is a general term that refers to uh, illicit sexual activity. Now, what is illicit or prohibited sexual activity? I want you to hear this verse. Because of the temptation of sexual immorality, there's our word, pornea, each one should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. You see, Paul frames that word pornea right there in Corinthians 7, 2 in the context of marriage. In other words, any sexual activity outside of marriage needs to be put to death. It's evil. That's what Paul's saying. Some of you walked in that. He goes, don't do that anymore. <laughs> All right? Pornea. It's a general term that refers to sexual activity, which is sex outside of marriage. It more literally referred to uh, prostitution, harlotry. But it can refer to every other form of sexual activity you might think of. So that word enables us to say that any form of sexual activity not within the confines of heterosexual marriage, as Paul said in Corinthians 7, 2, man have a woman, and he speaks there of a male with a female and a female with a male. Anything outside of that is sinful and should be put to death, deprived of power. That's pornea. Then he goes to uncleanness. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the, the Greek on that one. It just, I really don't know exactly how to define that, to be honest with you. It seems to me that it's even a bit more vague, really. I mean, like, okay, Paul, uncleanness? Like, help me out. What's that exactly mean? I know what pornea means because that, I, you've defined it. We understand that. What's uncleanness? And I think it, and I think, and I'm, I'm prefacing it with that. I think it means that you're, you're kind of keeping yourself in a pornographic kind of world where I'm making available to myself with my eyes or my ears just stuff that's unclean. This word enables us to say that using my eyes to see, allowing my ears to hear, or my hands to touch another person's private parts is sinful. The next word is passion. Uh, that word is pathos. It's also used at Romans chapter 1 and 1 Thessalonians 4. And it's a word that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a word that speaks of uh, a very, very strong desire. Okay? I have a very strong desire. Sex is not bad. Sex is wonderful. I have a very strong desire for sex. I'm not married. Well, then I look to the glory of Christ to help me through to keep my body under. Because <laughs> he's all powerful and he can do that. And I can actually live a celibate holy life, which really infuses the fellowship among my brethren and it gives me a constant joy and a witness to people who are struggling. Passion, pathos. Let me say this, a little bit of an adult statement here, but that word listed alongside the other words enables us to say that sleeping together in the same bed, kissing passionately, fondling, oral sex, sexting, everything except the actual act of intercourse is evil and needs to be put to death. Amen. Amen. Paul's using that word, passion, with the big five. He's, he's going through it, and he's, and he's putting it right there in the context with fornication and uncleanness and passion. You see it? 
And so I, I, I like the way Paul does that because some people get confused about this. Well, we actually haven't had intercourse. Um, really? <laughs> so you've done everything except, and that's okay? Yeah. No. <laughs> And then he uses the word evil desire. It's a different word, epithumia, right? Uh, it's, it's even more of that same thing. And, I, and John Piper made a statement, uh, not in this context, but in a different one. And I loved, he went back to the Song of Solomon because in the Song of Solomon, several times, she says, do not awaken love before the time. And I think that's a beautiful statement. Single person, unmarried person, divorced, widow, whatever your status, if you're not married, don't awaken love before the time. You can't take fire into your bosom and not burn the hair off your chest. <laughs> that's my stupid <laughs> paraphrase. <laughs> you're going to burn. <laughs> it's gonna, you're going to burn. You can't touch a woman and be innocent. So, if you're dating, you're thinking of or planning to marry or engage to be married, the questions of how far can I go or what is off limits, is it okay to do things as long as we don't have intercourse? Paul's given you an answer. <laughs> don't awaken love before the time. And so I know I'm speaking to a limited audience here at this moment, but uh, I do want to say, young men, if you're single, set the tone in your relationship. You be the leader. You establish firm boundaries. If you experience arousal from just kissing your girlfriend or holding her hand, then I would suggest don't awaken love before the time. It's not that it's wrong. Paul's like, but it, it could lead to wrong. So don't put yourself in that place. If you are currently engaged in fornication, then Paul's saying, don't do that. You need to live for the glory of God. And guess what? You'll be better off because of. You will. It, as we'll see in our story of Joseph which you can turn back there for the sake of time. Genesis 39. Let me just show you uh, from the life of Joseph. Very famous story. You all know this. Uh, Joseph is down in Egypt. Praise the Lord for Egypt. A little shout out there, Mina. Uh, Genesis 39. <laughs> Never mind. Genesis 39. Let me just read the first... Uh, Ten verses. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. Now notice how many times the Lord is mentioned here. Notice this. The Lord was with Joseph. Guess what? He knew it. He knew it. The Lord was with him. Joseph knew that. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house. And all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. And I love the last sentence. Joseph was a stud. All right, that's, that's my translation. Okay, he was handsome in form and appearance. <laughs> he knew that too. They had mirrors in Egypt. <laughs> Don't fool yourself. He stood in front. He's like, flex, not bad. <laughs> By the way, 
He's about 18 years old. At this point in Joseph's life, he is a young man, you would say, in the prime of his life. You know what that means? His sex drive is strong. He's single. He's attractive. He's alone. He's a long way from home. And nobody knows what he's doing except God. And he's living under his sight and in full knowledge. Verse 7. Now this is where you'll see why I'm here. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. Now there's a progression in that verse. It came to pass that she cast her eyes on him. In other words, before she actually said, let's do it, <laughs> she, her body language was flirtatious. You know it. That's how it went down. She looked forward when the workday would start and young 18-year-old, good-looking Joseph would walk in the house and she would conduct herself and maybe wear things and do stuff that would just like try to catch his eye. And Joseph knew it. And Joseph knew what was going down. He's like, oh my goodness, this adult married woman is coming on to me. And then finally, it just broke loose. She said, let's have sex. Now his response in verse 8 is quite interesting. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, <laughs> my master does not know what is with me in the house and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness in sin against God. <laughs> Joseph has passions, he has desires. You know, I'll be honest with you. I read that several times, and at first, to be very honest, I thought, this guy's like some kind of a machine. It's like, dude, do you have any spark of desire in you? I mean, she's standing there going, come on. My guess is she's making, exposing herself for a little bit. And he just comes off with this kind of mechanical machine like, man, 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 I can't do this. Doesn't, it's not at all. You know why he responded like that? Because she had been flirting with him. Because he would go back to his home and he would wrestle with his desire with God. And I think and I suggest to you that he walked through it and he thought, what if I did? What if this woman who's very obviously interested, what if I did? And then he started to count the cost, the consequences that would come. What would my parents say? What would my grandparents say? What would happen at work? What about people at church? Better not go there anymore. Because I don't want them to know. Joseph, I think he wrestled with all that, my friends. And the Lord was with him. And he knew it. And he got to the place where he said, Oh, God, strengthen me in the hour of trial. Be there with me. Because I do have desires, but I'm not married. And she is. And by the way, the Ten Commandments weren't written. There was no law that said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. That was hundreds of years down the road. How did he know this? The Spirit of God and a moral conscience said, no, 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 no. So he thought it through, and I suggest you think it through. If you're going to compromise now, do you think you won't compromise after you're married? You are ignorant of your flesh. He wrestled with it and he set his mind on things above. And you know the thing that comes out of these verses when you get past all this, what sounds like a machine, is you see a man who's living under authority. 
Potiphar bought me for a price. He owns me. And besides that, over his head is my God who's with me. And I'm not going to jeopardize all the freedom that I have in walking with him. Guys, you know where this story goes. It tells us in the next verse, so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day. <laughs> Mortify therefore your sinful desires which are upon the earth. Keep on putting them to death. But he did not heed her to lie with her and to be with her. So she set him up. She betrayed him. He ends up in prison. Do you know what? He ended up in prison a free man. She ended up a free woman in prison. Because she's just consumed by her lust, her covetousness. I want what is not mine. Give me a man or a woman who lives like that, and we will change the world. We'll change the church. Because sexual compromise is rampant through the church. Ah, that's not a fair statement. I wish I could take that back. It exists in the church. Give me a man or a woman who lives like that, and we will change the culture, the world, and the church. Joseph did. This guy ended up being the vice pharaoh, VP. He changed the world. And it all started with a little temptation in private. That's the word of the Lord. Let's stand and pray. Not much more to say, Lord. You've said it so clearly. I thank you for Paul's going right to the applicational point of stuff that had been common practice for the people in Colossae. Lord, we recognize that maybe it's not sexual problems that we brought into the church in our relationship. Maybe it's other things. I think it's fair to say, Lord, there is nothing impossible for you. We certainly see that in the life of Joseph. He was victimized. He was human trafficked. Hated by his own brethren. He seems to have, in you, lived and lived well. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much that it's true today. Perhaps even more so because of Christ lives in me. Thank you, Lord. We submit our lives to you. We pray in your name. Amen. God bless you.